And now it's my pleasure to turn the floor over to Jenny Arena. Thank you so much, Adam. So you know I'm Jenny Arena, and I'm with Heritage Preservation. We're so glad you're joining us today. It looks like right now the room has 126 folks in here, and it's slowly climbing. Let me go ahead and start by giving a quick introduction to the community and these webinars, and then we'll move on to our topic. So Heritage Preservation is moderating the Connecting to Collections online community in cooperation with the American Association for State and Local History and with funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. The site is designed and produced by Learning Time. And the goal of the online community is to help smaller museums, libraries, archives, and historical societies quickly locate reliable preservation resources and network with their colleagues. In developing the community, we've drawn on many resources that were developed for the C2C initiative, including the bookshelf and the Raising the Bar workshops and webinars. Links to all of these resources can be found under our Topics menu on the main website. Then about once a month or more, the online community features a particularly helpful preservation resource or topic and hosts a webinar related to it. Recordings of these webinars are archived on our main homepage, connectingtocollections.org. Today's webinar will also be recorded and added to the archive, and you can see a new topic menu webinar archives there. And they're also filed under the topics menu by subject. Now today I am so pleased to welcome Kathleen Kiefer and Petra Slinkart. Uh, both women are from the Indianapolis Museum of Art. Kathleen is a senior conservator of textiles, and Petra is a curatorial associate, associate within textile and fashion art. And they've kindly agreed to lead this discussion today on mounting garments for display with an emphasis on mounting to mannequins. Kathleen and Petra, would you mind telling the group a little bit about yourself? And Kathleen, we'll go ahead and start with you. Okay, great. This is uh, Kathleen Kiefer, as Jenny said, and uh, I'm the Senior Conservator of Textiles at the Indianapolis Museum of Art. I've been here a little over five and a half years, and um, we're very exhibition-driven in the work that we do here. Lots and lots of uh, textiles being uh, prepared for display. Um, prior to coming to the Indianapolis Museum of Art, I was a textile conservator at uh, Winnetur Museum, uh, Gardens and Library and uh, also involved in uh, teaching in the graduate conservation training program there. And my name is Petra Slinkard, and I have been with the Indianapolis Museum of Art in the Textile and Fashion Arts Department for about six years. Actually, May will be my sixth year. And prior to um, working at the IMA, I worked um, as a curatorial assistant um, with the Sage Collection, which is a social history um, clothing collection uh, located on Indiana University's campus in Bloomington, Indiana. And um, I also did some work with the Kinsey Institute and their clothing collection um, and have been heavily involved in assisting Kathleen um, with mounting exhibitions, but also um, working alongside our curator, Neelu Paydar, in researching and developing uh, the thesis for multiple exhibitions at the IMA. Great. Thank you both so much. So before we get started, we just wanted to ask a few poll questions to get a feel for our audience. Um, and as we've done in webinars in the past, these will be door prize questions. So we'll choose some of our respondents at random, and you'll win uh, your choice of a, a book from the C2C Bookshelf. So our first question is, what type of collections do you work with? And I'll give you some time to fill that out. And I'll also pull over our second question. To get an idea of how big your institution is, and we go about that by asking how large your staff is. So it looks like about 68 of you, and this is still ticking, um, are from a historical, work with historical collections, um, and a few, a few of our other options. And it looks like we have a pretty good mix of how large your staff is. As you can see, most popular is five or less. So some smaller institutions with us today. Okay, I'm going to move these over. And I've got one more question for you, which relates to today's topic, of course. Is Do you currently use mannequins to mount historical garments? And your options are yes and no, and then no, but you are interested in starting or learning more. I'll give you a few seconds to answer that. 
Looks like we have 144 people in the room with us. So a lot of you say yes, 76 say yes, only six say no, and then another 43 say no, but you're interested in learning more, which is fantastic. Okay, so I'm going to move over Kathleen and Petra's PowerPoint, and they wanted to start today off. a video. So I'm going to launch that in just one second. Feel free throughout their presentation to ask questions. I'll make sure to save those and we'll ask them as soon as they're done presenting. Okay, Kathleen and Petra, I'm going to go ahead and hit play on this. For this exhibition, uh, we have a select set of mannequins. And for the most part, those um, mannequins work quite well uh, for our needs. However, for this uh, show, because it was a very contemporary show, um, there were some pieces that we needed to make some adjustments to. And some pieces we really have to be um, kind of creative in how we build out and manipulate the mannequins. You know, it's not a clothing store. We don't have a variety of sizes to choose from. We have one size and that's you know, it was built for a particular person, and so we have to accommodate in the best possible way. Each piece requires a lot of individual attention. We had to really uh, modify a mannequin as for this dress here by um, Terry Mugler. It's called the Space Age Cocktail Dress, and this dress has um, a 22 and a half inch waist, um, which is actually very small. When you see a final product, and it's with any kind of art or technology, you know, your people, I think we tend to be so um, engrossed in the final product that we don't stop to think about all the steps that we took to get there. In some cases, we really have to be um, kind of creative in how we you build out and manipulate the mannequins. Okay, I'm going to move this over and then I'll hand things over to you guys. All right, you're all set. Great. Okay. Petra, you can just get started for us. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, and having looked at the, the results of the survey questions, um, it looks like most of the people um, who have signed on are from smaller institutions. And I'd like to point out just from the, the get-go that while the IMA is a larger institution and we are um, very fortunate to have um, a lot of resources at our disposal. Um, the textile department um, is actually just a department of essentially four people. So we can kind of relate to some of the smaller institutions um, that are working with a staff of maybe five or six. Um, so just can keep that in mind um, that we appreciate where you're coming from. Um, and so one of the first things that we wanted to talk about was to just kind of give you an overview of, you know, what our starting point is anytime we do an exhibition. And um, the, the focus of this presentation will be primarily on um, 20th century and um, in some cases 21st century um, garments and mounting those garments. But um, we do very frequently work with historical um, dress, both male and female, um, and we work with ethnographic um, dress and textiles as well. So um, anytime we're preparing an exhibition, we're constantly looking um, at a variety of resources and brainstorming to figure out the best ways um, to present those pieces. And so the first thing that we essentially do is research. Um, then we do assessments of the garments, and then we collaborate um, with conservation. And some of the first steps that I take, um, basically when we're pulling together a checklist is, you know, we pull everything that we're considering, and we go in with the conservators and look at every individual piece and determine together whether or not um, this piece is safe to um, to show um, what can it withstand the time period that we're looking at for the exhibition run? Um, does it actually fit well um, within the thesis of the proposed exhibition? Um, and then from that point forward, if, if it's a yes, um, then I consult as many relevant resources as I possibly can to get a feel for how this piece um, was presented um, on a, a live person. Um, and sometimes some of the resources that I use are catalog resumes, exhibition catalogs. Um, there are so many costume history books 
that are available. Um, but some things that I find to be very useful are historical periodicals. Um, and if you use uh, Google Books, you can access a lot of the historical periodicals um, online um, by typing in a particular designer's name or maybe a time period. Um, and sometimes we also rely heavily on historical um, patterns. And I think just getting it sort of a, a feel for how something was worn and within the context that it was worn can be very helpful when um, devising the best way to present that piece. Um, also looking at other museum collections, um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be um, limited, of course, to art museums, um, but many uh, collections are now putting their pieces online and just getting an idea for you know, what other pieces are similar to yours, uh, maybe if you are focusing on a specific designer, um, looking at institutions that have work by that uh, same designer. Um, and then some other online resources that I find to be helpful um, are fashionencyclopedia.com, um, the Vintage Fashion Guild, and then um, fashionera.com. Um, and so this is just a nice little um, display of how historical or sartorial uh, silhouettes change. Um, and we really look at how the the basis, the foundation of a garment um, exists in order to build or create the best um, or most appropriate silhouette. And so while we'll focus mostly on contemporary um, pieces today, I think it was important to um, include the fact that what, what we're talking about today can be used in a historical context as well. Um, and so this is just one example of uh, a range of historical silhouettes, and there are plenty um, in the resources that are available to you in, in the library or online. And this is a screenshot from uh, the website fashionera.com. Um, and if you are looking for resources, I think that this is a, a good one because it will break down um, in specifics um, silhouettes, colors, fabrics, details. Um, some institutions will. Um, prefer to present uh, clothing with the use of accessories um, or other embellishments, whereas sometimes art um, institutions will present pieces on their own. Um, you notice that we cut the heads off of our mannequins, and that's sort of a, a choice that we made um, in the way that we present our pieces. Um, as I said, patterns um, provide a nice reference um, for developing um, an idea for what kind of accessories go with your pieces um, and how maybe the stance or the, the mode that um, best suits your uh, garment. Um, and so once we've sort of gotten together for an initial chat about what we're going to show. Um, then from the curatorial perspective, the, the first thing that we really think about is, well, what is it about this piece that stands out to us? How, um, what, is, what is the design element that makes this um, piece, this garment, this ensemble um, appropriate to show within the thesis of this exhibition? And that's what we want to um, present to our public. And so, you know, from our perspective, um, from that point forward, we need to collaborate with the conservators to figure out what is the most appropriate way to safely um, present this piece. Um, and then sort of the secondary is, well, what is the mood of the exhibition? Um, what is the style or the attitude um, that's appropriate for the mannequin? Because even though they are inanimate objects, they definitely have attitude and they definitely have um, style. And from a conservation point of view, my main focus is always the safety of the garment, the safety of the artifact, the safety of the museum collection piece. Um, from a broad perspective, um, that would be thinking about the uh, exhibition environment, light levels, how long something is on display, um, uh, your standard careful handling, museum practices, things like that. There are references out there um, that will give specifics on that, so we're not going to cover that today in any depth, but just know that everything is predicated on that careful handling and um, respect that we have objects that may be fragile and that our goal is to preserve these over time. Um, 
focusing a little bit more on individual objects, once I have a checklist of uh, pieces that are proposed for an exhibition, um, we really look at uh, condition. Um, is the piece deteriorated in some way? Um, is it worn? Uh, is there something physically or chemically about it that makes it particularly fragile? Um, and then certain garments um, have uh, inherent vulnerabilities. Um, just, you know, what, how they're made. Things that are made from knitted fabrics. Over time, if they're hanging on a hanger, you know they'll start to expand under the forces of gravity. The same thing is going to happen to uh, garments on a mannequin. So, we make note of these characteristics and in planning the way that we're mounting, we try to um, ameliorate that, do things that are going to uh, sort of disperse that force of gravity that could be damaging. Uh, the example that you're looking at right now, the uh, it's a callow sewers uh, dress from 1926, and these uh, 20s dresses, most people are familiar with them, um, often they're uh, very lightweight silk fabric, chiffon, for example, with lots of heavy beads and embellishments attached. Um, those can be really problematic as they age. The silk is fragile and heavy beads on there. Often we see those in a condition that they really can't be displayed on a mannequin. This particular gown um, has uh, silk cloth embroidery mostly, but there's a very uh, heavy um, embellishment right on the uh, center front. And uh, that's made from heavy beads. And what we've done in this case is to actually attach on the inside of the dress some Velcro that then matches to Velcro that is on a corresponding spot on the mannequin. And what that does is take the weight of this really heavy embellishment off of the dress fabric and allows this to be safely um, exhibited. Um, Another uh, thing that we see often in garments is uh, garments that are cut on the bias, and uh, that means the straight of grain is at a 45 degree angle, and uh, fabrics tend to be quite stretchy in that direction. Uh, this dress here is one of Halston's uh, spiral cut gowns. We'll talk about this a little bit later on. but. Um, just for the period of display on a mannequin, we see uh, movement in um, bias cut garments. So those are notes that we take um, as we're preparing and uh, planning for how we'll mount the garments. Um, and then going back just briefly to you know assessing what is it that we want to show, um, we think a lot about what kind of mannequins we have, um, and really I think. It all boils down to being able to use what you have um, most effectively. And we are lucky we do have a wide range of mannequins, um, but they're not always uh, perfect. And so the examples that you see on the screen um, are two pieces by Halston. Um, and the blue um, evening ensemble, which is a two-piece pajama ensemble, um, it has this very beautiful um, full Sleeve. And if both arms were at the side, you would completely lose um, the benefit of that gorgeous sleeve. And so for, for that mannequin, we actually broke the arm and reset it, um, allowing us an opportunity to showcase that um, aspect of the design. Um, the other dress, which is a, a very, very heavy um, beaded gown, um, features this beautiful um, slit in the, front, in the front of the dress. And so the pose that we chose for this mannequin um, needed to be elegant to correspond with the design of the dress, but also the stance um, allowed us to showcase that aspect of the dress um, perfectly. And because of the um, heavy beading, it was also nice that that um, stretch that you see that of fabric between the legs, our viewers were able to get close enough um, to see uh, the, the type of stitching and the way that the beads were um, uh, hand sewn. And this is an example of how um, sometimes, <laughs> again, the mood that's created based on how the garments are put on the mannequins can change. Um, the uh, image that you see where the cape is draped over the arms is from a later exhibition um, on Christian Dior. 
And um, it, get, it allowed us an opportunity to really show this beautiful ball gown um, in its simplicity. Um, but you can see that when the cape is put on with the addition of a head and um, gloves, that the entire um, mood or feel of the garment um, has changed. And something that I, I've found, and I think probably most of you have maybe experienced in one way or another, is that people are very passionate about mannequins. Um, but I do think that it all boils down to your institution's preferences and that it's important to decide what your goals as an institution are. Um, from our perspective as an art museum, we look at these objects as works of art. And so to us, while the mannequins do um, resemble human form, they are truly equivalent to a pedestal or a frame that would be used to showcase another type of artwork. Um, and I'm not going to read this um, to you, but this is a, an anonymous comment to a blog post that I had written on some of the mannequin um, customizations that we've done. And um, this person, you know, had very, very strong feelings about the skin tone, um, quote unquote, skin tones that we had used, the paint um, that we chose, and, you know, why we, she, in her opinion, seemed to uh, present these objects with more care when they were contemporary versus historical. And my rebuttal to her was that, you know, for historical garments, we use Kyoto mannequins that are specialized and used by uh, many institutions. And that there's a, a reason that for using the Kyoto mannequins, which is based on the stance that you cannot possibly achieve with a contemporary mannequin. Um, and in the references that we'll have for you today, um, you can uh, link to that and read the post and also read my response. Um, and I think, as I said, it's important to use what you have at your disposal. Um, and so whether you choose to go head or headless, um, other options that we have are half leg ma mannequins, dress forms, and then the custom adjustments that we make ourselves. And in some cases, having a head, whether it has stylized features, stylized hair, stylized poses, can be appropriate, um, as the example that you see on the screen here. Um, and in other cases, not having a head um, can also be uh, quite effective, because in this case, I think not having the head in the presentation of this um, bondage suit by Westwood and McLaren, you really, um, the eye is really drawn to the details of the garment, which in our um, aspect is the most important part. Um, this is an example of a half-legged form, um, the blouse by Franco Moschino. And in this case, we only had the blouse. We didn't have the accompanying, um, any accompanying um, bottom. And so we chose to create prop skirts to cover those legs. And again, in an effort to sort of minimize um, any um, distracting elements of the display, and then also um, the dress form. And then customized mannequins is something that we um, are fortunate to do here. Um, however, if you have access to um, a, a table saw or if you have access to, um, you know, other standard power tools, um, you yourself are capable of, of making these kinds of adjustments. Um, and I'll just scroll through here, and this is Kathleen working on the form that you just saw. Um, the reason that we removed the bust for this uh, mannequin was we initially used it to showcase um, a Rudy Gernreich design from the 60s, and the bust point was just simply too low, and so we made the decision to remove the bust, and um, Kathleen built a new bust line for it. Um, this is a, an example of the modification that we made to a mannequin um, to accommodate the Terry Mugler dress with the, the small waist. Um, and really removing both sides of the mannequin was the best um, move for us because we needed the stomach uh, to be full in order to support uh, the dress. And also we needed the back to be full to support the back of the dress. Um, this is an example of making a mannequin taller. Um, a lot of times hem length. Uh, is something that we consider to be very important when presenting um, historical garments, whether they are 20th century or um, from previ previous um, centuries, because the hem length is so important to the way that the dress is presented. And so in some cases, we will have to um, make a mannequin shorter, or in this case, we've um, added at the film in order to make her taller. And Kathleen, do you want to talk about mannequin research? Sure, I'll do that. Um, what 
we've done here, sometimes we buy, if you have a big budget, our museum, we usually use what we have on hand, but I've heard tell of some shows where they have a budget for mannequins, and uh, some of the resources for mannequins are in these next a few slides. Uh, Goldsmith is a company that's been around a long time and um, does beautiful quality mannequins. Uh, the page that I am showing here shows that they have a, a huge variety available. Um, so if you're shopping, that's one resource to check out. Um, Rootstein is another mannequin manufacturer that's been around a long time. Um, often mannequins are um, based on individuals, models for example, and uh, I don't know how they do it, if they cast their body or sculpt from them. Um, Rootstein is one of the first, I understand, to do that, but they have a huge array available, uh, good quality, reputable company. Um, and then with the Internet now, um, there are tons of resources there. If you Google mannequins, you'll find all kinds of things. Uh, <laughs> and we've had some interesting experiences. Um, Petra, I'll let you talk about it. Since you well, know, my advice would just be to plan ahead. Um, we've had um, experiences where ordering male mannequins, um, orders have been canceled without us knowing it. Factories have gone on strike. Um, we've run into the problem of um, ordering mannequins during Chinese New Year. Um, or in some cases, we've ordered mannequins and what shows up is not at all what we ordered. Um, and so I would say definitely planning ahead. Um, but Las Vegas mannequins, um, we just had a, ordered a shipment from them uh, recently, um, five male mannequins. And um, the price point was um, decent. And, you know, it was a, it was a good experience. Um, but I would definitely say planning ahead is important because you do not know what you're going to get um, when you're ordering mannequins. Um, and then what do you do with them when you have them? Um, we have about 100 mannequins or so in our stock. Not all of them are great. Some get used um, over and over and over again, and some only get used one or once or twice, depending on what it is that we're um, uh, showcasing. But I like to keep the mannequins put together. Um, I think it's easier to keep track of all their pieces. Um, and so what we've done to catalog them is we have a, a mannequin um, binder where each individual mannequin is given a name. Um, the style of the mannequin is recorded. We've done um, detailed measurements of the mannequin from head to toe. Um, and then a corresponding sheet uh, goes with the mannequin itself. And you can see that um, on the image on the screen where there's a plastic um, sleeve with twill tape, um, and basically that is their hang tag. And when we're preparing for an exhibition, we keep all of the um, bits and pieces that go with the mannequin within the plastic sleeve or any notes that may um, uh, address the piece that it will be wearing. Okay, and I'm going to talk uh, about sort of nuts and bolts things now. Um, so when you're trying to find a mannequin for a particular garment um, or want to purchase mannequins, um, I've found that the measurements that are highlighted here are the ones that are the most critical to try to get in the ballpark uh, when you're trying to match a garment to a mannequin in terms of fit. Um, and what we do as in museums and as conservators is that we always fit the mannequin to the garment rather the, than the other way around. Um, we always want to preserve the garment in as best condition as possible and, um, you know, not alter it, try not to misrepresent it. So what is good to do is get a stock of mannequins that are smaller in size. Um, you have more flexibility in terms of what they'll fit. Um, a lot of historic costume is quite small, and uh, partly it may be that just the small things that no one else could wear survive. Uh, so that can be a challenge. So we're always really looking for small sizes. Uh, but when you do have some mannequins at your disposal and you have garments that you've identified uh, to display, uh, using a soft tape measure and measuring the inside of your garment um, at the points that are noted here, the bust circumference, the waist circumference, the hip circumference, um, and the center back length, that's one that um, is critical. And that is from, there's a sort of a bone at the sort of base of the neck, top of the back. Um, from that, bone that protrudes a bit down to the waist, um, 
that gives you a lot of good information. Often garments, um, the waist point is defined, and then the shoulder and bust are other defined points. So getting in the ballpark there is good. Um, and then another one that I like to do is the shoulder to the bust point. And as Petra talked about earlier, um, sometimes we'll actually remove the breasts from the mannequin. Say 1970s silhouette was uh, when, you know, a braless, very natural uh, bust line was popular. And um, for a 50s garment, um, especially, it's just too low and sort of gets in the way of where the bust point should be. So removing them and rebuilding is um, an option that we exercise. If you have a super small mannequin, um, you can sometimes just, you know, ignore that the breast is there and build a new one. That's about it. If you don't aren't able to cut into your mannequins, don't want to do that. Um, what I've gathered here is an array of tools that um, I find useful, and it, you really don't need a lot to do uh, the mannequin dressing. Um, I've got some nitrile gloves pictured here. Um, in terms of handling a garment, you want to be very careful with it. Of course, you know, have clean hands, use gloves if necessary. Having a glove that's very fitted uh, helps you uh, with manual dexterity, stitching and such. So if you're um, not able to wash your hands frequently, um, wearing gloves is a good idea. Um, a variety of scissors, uh, pins. Um, there's, let's see if I can figure out the arrow. Uh, this little guy here, this uh, silver tool is a uh, micro spatula. Lots of conservation labs have those. Uh, they're handy for tucking things in. And then my most favorite tool is uh, this right here. I call it my mannequin dressing stick. And um, it has a nice curve to it. And I find it really useful for uh, tucking uh things in and laying things smooth inside of a garment. And this is something I found when I was visiting uh, one of the Shaker villages in the Northeast, and there was a guy who was weaving uh, a chair seat out of uh, woven tapes, and I, he had the tape threaded through this uh, stick, I'll go back, that um, was like a big needle, and I just thought, wow, that looks so useful. I have to have one of those. So what he had made it from was uh, one of the backs of the chair that didn't quite work out. So uh, I was able to get that from him. But I love this tool. And uh, if you can find something like that, it's uh, a useful thing to have. Um, let's see. And then materials and supplies. Of course, uh, we want to use things that are acid-free, archival quality. Um, when we're doing these sort of additive um, modifications to a mannequin, um, mostly what we'll cover here today is adding, padding, and building a silhouette with these materials. Um, it's good to have something that you can um, anchor your padding onto. So what I like to use is a tubular cotton stockinette um, material, which is this stuff right here, and uh, you can get it from a surgical supply. A lot of people have used pantyhose in the past. They uh, sort of pull them on the bottom of the mannequin over the legs and bottom torso and then cut the crotch out and pull that over the head or over the neck. I have a sort of general aversion to pantyhose, so I really like using the tubular stocking at. Um, Let's see, other materials that are here, this polyester needle punch batting. Uh, needle punch is, um, if you hold the batting up to the light, uh, you'll see sort of little holes in it. And it's put together uh, by being felted rather than using adhesives. Um, and in the past, some of the adhesives that uh, are in batting have yellowed. Um, I think that that may not be such a problem these days. But uh, we do choose to use needle punch batting or uh, polyester felt. Um, we also have use uh, loose polyester fiber fill sometimes. So that's what the little uh, cloud of stuff is right here that you would uh, use to stuff animals with. Um, 
I got these out of order. There's the stocking net up close. You can see that it's quite stretchy. And uh, this wide one here, it measures eight inches across. And this is a good size to actually pull over the torso of a mannequin. And then this is a two inch across uh, stocking net. Um, let's see, twill tape, indispensable. Um, You'll see the use of that in several places. Uh, nylon net or tool that you get uh, from your local fabric store that's uh, the black and white here. These are sort of a finer version like bridal veiling. Also sometimes we'll use a larger, stiffer net. Um, it can be a little scratchy, so sometimes you'll want to isolate it from your garment. And then another material that I've been using sometimes is uh, high-density polyethylene sheeting. It's uh, three mil, uh, this particular version, so it's very lightweight. Um, sometimes I use it as stuffing, using that little mannequin stick I have to tuck in side garments, and then it's also really useful uh, as a dust cover if you're dressing mannequins and they have to hang around for a while before the uh, uh, exhibit opens. Um, and then thread, of course, uh, and I like to use cotton thread the best. It seems to be the easiest to use when you're stitching through polyester batting. It doesn't tend to develop static and twist and knot as readily as uh, some of the poly threads do. Um, so just for ease of use. And then um, covering fabrics, uh, just uh, basic cotton knits that you can get from your local fabric store. Uh, whenever I do buy things from the local fabric store, I always uh, pre-wash them. And what I usually do is uh, put my washing machine on uh, the gentle permanent press cycle and put in a small amount of one of the uh, Tide-free um, regular laundry detergent, put in my fabric, and uh, then I do it, run it through once with detergent, and then a second cycle um, with just water. Um, and then I'm being sure to rinse out uh, any adhesive residue, and hopefully we're getting rid of sizings, um, anything that could be problematic for the garment. And then, um, Costume exhibits tend, we, you know, it's not a good idea to uh, keep things up permanently over time, so we consider them sort of a short-term installation. So I don't audi test everything that we're using because of time, but um, we haven't noticed any problems. Um, and I, we do have a program of audi testing that we're uh, working on here at the museum. I'm, I'm trying to go back and test a lot of things that we're standardly using, so I'll keep you posted. And, let you know if there are problems. Um, some things to do before you start um, is understand your mannequin. Um, we have many different sorts, and on the uh, slide here, you'll see uh, different arm attachment methods. Um, this is a fairly common one. Uh, behind this uh, sort of nipple here, there are uh, angled sides, and they'll slip into this little keyhole um, opening. Um, but you have to get them just right. Uh, this is actually one of the Kyoto mannequins up here, and they have a, an easier arm attachment mechanism. And then uh, hands, they have, they're have they removable. Um, and sometimes they're really difficult to uh, get the arms and um, hands on and off. So, And sometimes you have to really pull the arm far forward to get it to the point where it'll pop in and out of that mechanism. Um, so it's a really good idea to, and they're all individuals too. You can have the same model of mannequin and one will behave differently from another. So we always will try to, you know, figure out the quirks of the mannequin before we even approach it with a garment. Um, you also want to make sure that it's clean and smooth, uh, that there aren't any areas on there that will catch or braid, um, that they're not covered with dust uh, and the like. Um, and then also, you, um, the conservator speaking here, you want to make sure that your hands are also clean and smooth before you start working. Um, this mannequin image that's here uh, shows a feature that I like in mannequins. Uh, this uh, join that's right here across the hip um, can be really useful, as Petra showed, for changing the height of a mannequin. So if you're shopping for mannequins, 
um, you might want to consider ones that have that feature. Um, many of them are solid there. Um, all mannequins, though, have arms that come off and, uh, for the most part, hands that come off. And I'll show you some examples as we go on where that's uh, really critical. Um, Let's see, this will be the basic procedure for um, covering or padding out a mannequin. The first thing we do is pull on a foundation. Uh, then we'll add uh, padding to create the silhouette that we like. And then um, I always like to cover up the polyester batting or fiber fill because those little fibers will um, really get tangled into in your object, and it's good to avoid that. Uh, what I'm showing here, this is a Bill Blass uh, pant, uh, pants ensemble from the 1980s, um, very oversized. And um, this is what the mannequin um, was padded out to uh, look like. It was uh, one of the 1970s um, bus-type mannequins. And I, I was surprised that how much a, of an improvement in the silhouette just adding uh, changing the bust shape, raising it, and making it a little bit fuller, um, how it supported that garment um, and really improved the interpretation and also the safety of the garment. It wasn't sort of hanging so much on the mannequin. Um, here's the back view. And this is something that we find sometimes and we kind of have to fudge certain things. Uh, the waist on the, the pants was smaller than the mannequin. So what I've done is take some um, uh, embroidery floss. It comes in a lot of colors, so some, you can uh, match your, uh, trying to get the arrow to move down there. Oh well. Uh, you can find a color that's not so obvious. But what I do is loop it through one side of the uh, hook and eye closure at the waist and then tie it to the other side. And then you can tuck that in, in the uh, lower um, image. Uh, you see that. And then here's the back of the mannequin uh, as it was for display. And with the shirt bloused over um, a bit, it wasn't obvious. I don't think that that was something that caught people's eyes. Um, what I'm going to do now is sprint through some case studies of uh, mannequins that we've dressed. This Halston jumpsuit is cashmere. It's a knitted uh, fabric. It's very drapey. And uh, what you see on the uh, right-hand side is the modifications that we've made to support the pantsuit. Um, I've got a uh, cotton stockinette uh, body stocking on there to sort of, it has some uh, nap to it. So having that in contact with the net, the uh, cashmere knit will uh, help that from uh, pulling under gravity. And then on the uh, knee, the leg also, the forward leg, I wanted to just sort of grab that and give that fabric a little support. You'll also notice that the um, bottom of the foot on this mannequin I can't get my arrow there. There it is. Um, is we've add, blocked that up to um, make the mannequin taller because you can see the pants are quite long as part of the jumpsuit. Uh, here are some more details. Um, again, 1970s um, nipples were really important then in fashion, and um, but I didn't want over time that to uh, stretch out the knitted fabric. So what I've done is uh, just make those a little less extreme. So there is some um, polyester fiber fill here and just rounds of uh, needle punch batting. And I've used those to cover the breast. And that's just tucked under this um, uh, cotton stockinette cover. And to do these, is, this is that eight inch tubular. Just pull it over, pull it over the mannequin, and um, cut out a bit for the uh, neck, and pull up the front and back, and at the shoulder seams, just stitch it there. And then you can also cut out uh, for your armhole. And to hold things, if I'm wanting to do the whole body, I just uh, pull it down between the legs, 
and you can see here, poke a little hole and then tie it. And then that makes a, a good firm um, anchor. In this case, it's just sort of a non-slip covering for the mannequin. But in other examples, this sort of thing serves as a foundation on which to build um, your changes. Uh, there's a close-up of the um, modified foot. Our exhibit uh, prep guys do these things for us. Um, you could also uh, just have a buildup that's separate from the mannequin to raise it as well. Um, with the really long leg, uh, we had a problem with the uh, heel of the foot draping sort of awkwardly there. So a uh, solution to that that was really easy was taking a piece of uh, two-ply mat board and uh, scoring it so that it would curve to mimic a heel and just tying it onto the foot. And and here we see um, a little bit uh, better drape as though she's got a, a shoe on with the heel. Um, another Halston dress. This one is um, a, a nice 1970s image that is a reference for us of what we're going for in terms of the look of the dress. And this diagram is nice. It also shows uh, the sort of spiral cut. Halston was known for these really um, amazing, actually, and very in their simplicity and just sort of different uh, garments. And so this puts the garment uh, fabric on the bias as it's on the mannequin. And uh, here's one of our dresses that's cut in this manner. So bias here. And you can see some sort of puckering along the seam, which is on the straight of grain. But this garment, too, was, uh, for some reason, it was stored hanging. So over time in storage, we've had some drooping. And there's actually uh, a lining inside the dress. And uh, that had expanded at a different rate than the fabric of the dress. So we had to make some alterations there. Um, again, the concept here is uh, to create a non-slip covering to help support this garment. We didn't have to do a lot of changing of the uh, silhouette of the mannequin because this is uh, great to have a 1970s mannequin when you're doing Halston clothing from the 70s. There was, however, a really severe uh, sort of break at the knee. So um, what I've done is padded that out here, and uh, we've got the two-inch tubular stockinette pulled over the leg to hold that padding in place, um, and that gave it a bit more elegant drape here. And then also, um, I think it'll be more clear in the next slide, um, there is a panel of nylon net, it, it's right here, that I've stitched to the front of this, um, sort of herringbone stitched it right across the edge, bottom edge of the stockinette. And this is serving as a uh, sort of slip to keep the dress from uh, collapsing between the legs. And then I think you can see that there are layers of batting built up here, uh, one underneath and then um, a bigger piece on top. And I tend to layer them um, and sort of bevel the edge, and that gives you a smooth, more smooth transition when you are adding padding. Another point to consider um, when you're looking at your garment and planning how you'll approach uh, dressing the mannequin so that we're not uh, handling it um, excessively. Uh, the, the sleeve openings here are really too small for the hands to pass through. Um, so they need to be removed definitely before the arm is inserted into the sleeve. And then uh, this picture here is showing the uh, top of the arm versus the cuff of the sleeve. And uh, there's no way that those will fit together. So to dress the mannequin, the sleeve needs to go in the neck and then down the, the, or the arm needs to go in the neck and down the sleeve here. And this is uh, why it's good to understand that mechanism that attaches the arm. Um, it's difficult to see that when you're actually trying to do it with a garment in place. Um, so it's helpful and you have to also be careful not to pinch the garment um, in the join when the, when the arm does attach. 
and um, then pop the hands on after the wrists have gone through the sleeves. Um, another Halston dress. Uh, this one is a beautiful uh, chiffon print and again another one of his masterful pieces. Um, it, it just slips on and then there's a little sort of keyhole shape here uh, under the tie and that holds everything on. Um, I was a little worried about this lightweight chiffon dress on the slippery mannequin um, falling down during the course of the exhibit. So again, I've done this sort of non-slip body stocking. Um, this one was just pulled over the head, that eight inch stockinette, and uh, we padded the bust out a bit to uh, help with supporting the dress and keeping it on. Um, but also, to with a strapless, um, we needed to keep that foundation in place. So what worked in this instance was to uh, use some sewing thread. Uh, I picked a color that was uh, close to the mannequin color, and I've just stitched into the uh, stockinette foundation and then brought it over the arm and stitched at the back of the mannequin. So very invisible. Um, also, the thread could push into this uh, seam here. And there's a close-up view of bus padding. And this is great when it can just sort of slip under the stockinette and the stockinette holds it in place for you. Um, oh, Petra, you can talk about this this guy. Okay. Well, we actually had a question um, from someone about how do you um, dress something when maybe the arms don't fit. And this is a perfect example. Um, this is a Chanel suit um, with very heavy um, brocade stiff fabric. And in 2002, we just didn't have um, the means or um, the know-how to create um, a, 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 the correct um, mount for this. And so um, the conservator at the time just basically just made the decision to show the garment without arms. You can see that the jacket is just draped over the shoulders. Um, and it gives them a very different feel and look. Um, whereas in 2012, we developed a new way of um, uh, basically dealing with this issue. And you can see that there there are arms um, and uh, there are hands. And it really does change the way <laughs> change the way that the piece is displayed. Okay. Um, this coat here, Bill Blast coat, had the same issue. The uh, shoulders were too broad for the coat um, when the arms were on. So... Um, and this coat had a lot of structure and a, quite a straight sleeve. So what we've done is just hang the hands. And then um, you can see here how we've um, adjusted the mannequin to improve the silhouette. Uh, this is stuffed um, in the chest area with, uh, there's that arrow, with nylon netting. And then um, it's got a little stockinette um, support foundation. And then, um, to accommodate for the missing top of the arm, I've done some sort of shoulder pads here uh, covered with stockinette, and it's uh, inside a quarter-inch thick um, needle punch batting. Um, and then here's the hand hanging, and this is how we do it. Um, this is a bent uh, wire um, that fits into the little keyhole that holds the arm. We have a fabulous mount maker at the museum here and he works in metal all the time and he just whipped up a number of these for us. Um, I think that there would be other ways you can do, actually we've done them with a toggle too. If you just have a, um, a straight piece of metal that you can put in here and then tie your uh, twill tape around that and then pull it down inside, um, it will hold as well. Um, and what I found is that uh, it, it's all tied on with twill tape, um, looping it through that hook at the arm first and then just leaving a long length. Then you can tie the uh, twill tape around the hand um, when the garment is on and you can adjust the length then. Um, what this is here is some hot melt glue and that's holding the twill tape in place. Um, there's not a lot of purchase on these slippery mannequin parts, um, so that's what's there. And then that can pop off after the exhibit. Um, of course, you don't want to be hot melt gluing um, in the vicinity of your garment. So 
that was sort of a test fitting and then removed and glued. Um, here you can see that the sleeve has been stuffed out with nylon net to give it uh, the shape of an arm since the arm is missing. Um, this is another one where the uh, sleeve was quite fitted and the shoulders were narrow and the dress would not fit with the arms on the mannequin. So we've done, uh, we thought, oh, we'll hang the hands. That'll be great. It didn't work in this case, however, because the sleeve was so fitted, um, it was shaped, uh, darts at the elbow, and it actually swung forward on the body. So when we put the hanging hands in there, um, it didn't give us the look we needed at all. So what we've done is um, sort of mock up an arm with this pipe that uh, fits into the keyhole there and mounted the hand on the bottom of that. Um, here is some padding that we needed to do to modify the silhouette or the fit of this garment, nylon net in the chest area. And then this is showing the sleeve is stuffed out and a bit here to compensate for the loss of um, the arm. Um, and there she is, ready to go. Um, and this uh, dress also needed a little fullness at the, at the hem in the bottom area. So this is another use of the cotton stockinette, just zipped over the mannequin. And then this is some uh, nylon net that is just pushed under the edge of it. So it's um, a quick and functional approach. Um, I would like to say that there are um, methods for mounting garments that this is sort of a uh, quick way of doing it. I think it's functional and supports the uh, garments. But uh, there's a book uh, by one of the um, uh, costume mounters at the Victoria and Albert Museum that shows you just an exquisite method for mounting and doing very tailored and finished supports for garments. Um, we're usually running uh, with about two months lead time for our installations, so I would love to work slower, but here we are. <laughs> Uh, this coat is uh, Halston, and it had some quirks. Uh, one side of the coat is longer than the other side, and this is something that was just inherent in the garment, and uh, our curator didn't necessarily want to call attention to that. Um, so what we've done is selected a mannequin with a bent knee, and... Uh, I think that that helps visually explain what's going on there, or at least sort of camouflage it. Um, also, the coat is open in the front, so we needed something to uh, put with this garment. Uh, what you're looking at are garments that are props, um, and here's a reference image right next to it that uh, Petra provided. So we wanted something that would provide the silhouette, but also just fade into the background and not be an assertive part of the exhibit. Um, so what I've done is get, um, this is a black polyester fabric. It's um, got a matte surface texture or sheen and uh, pre-washed, of course. And then uh, we're making up garments that appear as though they're from the 1970s. One thing I found, um, initially I had done a short uh, little top for this, but it was very distracting having the hemline here. So uh, made a tunic where the hem ended at the bottom of the coat. Okay, those. Um, this is a fun one too. Uh, Norma Norell cape suit from the late 1950s, just a beautifully tailored uh, and constructed garment. Um, but we uh, needed a blouse to go under it. We didn't. We just had the cape and the uh, skirt. We wanted to show some of the skirt rather than just buttoning the cape up altogether. So I said, well, we'll just kind of construct something to go under there, another prop garment. Uh, did some research online and found um, various illustrations of blouses um, with the same feeling. So this is just a mocked up blouse, actually. What you're seeing here is um, just a sleeve that's attached to the arm by a tube of the um, two-inch stockinette. 
uh, a faux collar, so just a piece of um, the polyester blouse fabric that's uh, oriented on the bias and wrapped around the neck, and then just a blouse front. So it really was sort of like a long dicky, and it's secured with twill tape. Um, so quicker to do, and we got the color and look we wanted. Uh, these are showing the padding out of the uh, bottom part of this mannequin to fit the skirt. Uh, here's the foundation of the cotton stockinette. Uh, there are several layers of uh, needle punch batting that I've stitched on here, cut and stitched on. Uh, you might see here some of the herringbone stitches. That's a really quick way of attaching. Um, also, I kind of like to round the edges of pieces that helps them blend. And then a really quick covering, just pulling over another uh, tube of the eight-inch wide cotton stockinette. Uh, oh, and this is a lovely dress. And in we, our curator does like to show things um, in a sort of an emphasized way. This has a full skirt, but we wanted to make sure that it was a really beautiful, really full skirt. So what we've done is. Um, use one of our prop petticoats. Uh, this is part of our collection of undergarments that we've made for dress, specifically for dressing mannequins. And uh, this is one that was uh, it, on our rack and was able to be used again. Um, you can see in this image here, uh, there's a black nylon net. And this is sort of a coarser, stiffer net that really the fullness. And it's covered over with a plain weave cotton fabric. Um, one of the nice things about this one, I didn't make this one, it was here when I came to the museum, but there, this is a tube of uh, cotton knit fabric that uh, you slip this on with, so it um, is flexible in terms of its sizing to fit many different mannequins. So that was nice that we had that ready to go. Um, this is uh, uh, a Stephen Sprouse garment. And this is an interesting one because the uh, bodice, as you can see, is a really lightweight nylon fabric. And then there's a sort of heavy faux fur skirt here. Uh, with that transparent top, there wasn't really any place to uh, support this red, um, heavy uh, skirt. Often I would use twill tape or something maybe and support it from the shoulders. So in this case, what I've decided to do is make this sort of big uh, extension around the hips that will actually touch the inside of the fur skirt and hold that in place. Uh, so here, lots of padding wrapped around the hips. Um, I've marked the uh, skirt length on with blue tape on my mannequin um, so I don't make it too too long. Um, this is an example where the uh, mannequin that is um, has the split across the hips came in handy um, because I needed to uh, hang that padding on uh, because it's below the waist. There's nothing that would really hold it there over time. So what I've done is uh, take a piece of cotton, plain weave cotton fabric, and make a platform across the um, waist or, or across the cross section of the hip of the mannequin. You can see that there. I picked a color that was close to the mannequin because uh, I was worried that it may show with the uh, sheerness of the bodice. And uh, that's what you're looking at here. This is the uh, hip sheer bodice part. And then looking inside, here is the black covered um, hip padding. And then this picture is large again, too. It's a little difficult to see. I actually used some uh, pins to hold this in place um, in, in the back. Um, and because of all the padding, the pins uh, could go right through the garment into the uh, padding. And I've opted for these uh, really fine sewing pins with a white glass head. I wanted to be sure that I would be able to find the pins again when it was uh, time to deinstall this. So that's why I opted for that. And you can just sort of hide them in the fur there. Um, we're over time, so I'm rushing. Um, this mannequin um, is also Stephen Sprouse. 
and a man's uh, tuxedo with a Keith Haring print. And what we've done here is used a female mannequin and um, adapted it to display this man's suit. Uh, the way I've done this is add um, padding in the chest area to serve as um, sort of a pectoral muscles there and kind of disguise the breast. We selected um, a mannequin with flat feet rather than high heels, of course. And then uh, another thing that I felt sort of characterized a male figure was uh, having um, some more fullness in the thighs. So in this case, um, what we've done is put uh, one pair of pantyhose on the bottom of the mannequin, uh, cut out some pads of uh, needle punch batting and layer them in there and you can see how they're layered to sort of blend and not have a sharp edge and then um, the legs of uh, another pair of pantyhose were cut off and um, that was pulled over the padding so you can see the second pair here um, and then um, once the jacket was on um, did a little bit more padding to uh, support the jacket and create the silhouette that I wanted. This is that uh, high density polyethylene plastic that slipped in there and then a big swath of it uh, wrapped around the waist. Um, this is a, uh, Petra, do you want to talk about this one? Um, sure. This is just an example of how depending on what um, the purpose of the exhibition is and the purpose of displaying that garment, how pieces can be displayed in different manners. Um, the similar um, caftan is, um, I'm sorry, it's a serape actually, uh, pin mounted on the view on the right, which is from an exhibition called Simply Halston from 2008. Um, and then it shows um, how the piece looks draped over a mannequin. Um, and obviously, um, we have not put any undergarments under it, and you can see that that would not be at all appropriate to um, display in the galleries that way. And so we did some research and, again, um, found images of uh, pieces that would have been worn underneath, and Kathleen um, very graciously made uh, prop pieces for them. Okay, and there's uh, our reference image and the props I made. And I didn't do such a tiny little bra. I don't know why <laughs> I decided to go for something bigger. Hmm. Um, and we're coming to the end now. This is a, a recent acquisition to the museum, uh, beautiful uh, Christian Lacroix. Um, and I mounted this. Um, and these strapless ones are sometimes tricky. To, uh, the, bo the bust of this garment was quite a bit larger than the mannequin. Um, and but you still want it to visually uh, correspond with the mannequin, so looks pretty good. Uh, getting a little closer looks pretty good, and then when you get really close, you can just you see how much difference there is. And what I found um, works in these situations is um, to just fit the back of the garment and push the bust fullness forward, pat it out, and then um, what I've done is filled in um, the gap with a fabric that is close in color to the mannequin or maybe the garment um, that sometimes that works. But you can see that it's just pinned in there with uh, insect pins to camouflage that. And that was sort of a sprint through. I hope that the mm -hmm. images, uh, just you know, seeing them is instructive. And I guess we can take some questions now. Uh, Jenny, do we have time for that? Yeah, we do. We have about five more minutes. I'm going to quickly pull over our survey. Thank you for everyone who's hung on past 3 o'clock. Um, we're going to try to fit a few questions in before 3.15. Um, if you guys could uh, take some time and fill out our survey, we really look at all your responses carefully, and they, they really help us plan our future events. So I'm going to go ahead and try to get a few questions in before our time is up. Um, Petra, I'll ask this one to you, and then Kathleen, if you want to jump in, that's that's perfect. Anne had a, a great question of what are the most important traits you look for in a mannequin for use at your institution? Is it based on the exhibit? Is it based on the piece? Um, well, we don't have, you know, I don't think anyone has a ton of money, and so that's always our 
what we're, you know, worried about sometimes is how can we get the most bang for our buck? And so when looking at mannequins, um, I think versatility is very important um, in selecting mannequins and then also the way in which mannequins are pieced together, um, particularly for male mannequins. We've seen examples where um, the arms will become... Um, will detach uh, below the shoulders, um, which will make it very difficult for a, a narrow, um, a narrower piece, whereas if the um, arms uh, detach at the actual arm thigh, it makes it a lot easier to do those kinds of modifications that Kathleen talked about. Um, and so uh, that is a consideration is how they're pieced together, but also sometimes facial features. Um, and a lot of um, the exhibitions that we do with ethnographic um, pieces or textiles, we will use faceless mannequins um, because we don't necessarily, again, we, we use the mannequin as a pedestal or as a frame, and we aren't trying to provide um, any kind of personal context to the pieces. Um, and so those are some of the things that we look at when we're purchasing mannequins. Great. Um, and Teacher did a fantastic job. Um, I'm, I may not ask some of the questions that were posed in the Q&A box because Petra already got them to, got to them. So thank you for that. Um, we did if, uh, have a question from Elizabeth. Kathleen, I'm going to pose this one to you. Are there any special considerations when you're working with ethnographic items? She says largely made of hide. Um, it, we often, with uh, ethnographic garments, will uh, make a custom form um, rather than a mannequin. Uh, sometimes um, it's easier to support um, the ethnographic sort of T-shaped garments, or if it's a hot, you know, not quite as tailored to um, a sort of fashion model body. But I don't think that uh, you know, with in terms of hide, um, you can't really pin through hide, um, so if you're needing to uh, make attachments or do anything uh, to support, uh, that would be something that you would be limited. Um, in terms of um, the mannequin itself and any kind of uh, negative interactions with the mannequin, I don't think that there'd be a problem with the hide. Um, we have um, used magnets um, to attach hide when we have to... Uh, uh, mount a hide object um, vertically. Um, I don't know. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Uh, let me ask one more question before our time is up. Um, this is a multi-part question. We had uh, Judy bring up the fact that a volunteer had made some wood forms, um, just raw wood sanded. She was wondering if there was any problems there, and then a few people responded um, to you know, make sure to sand it and paint it. And um, so, the first question, I guess, is there any problem with using a raw wood form? Yes, in a word. Yeah. Um, the wood tends to be an acidic material, um, so having um, museum objects in direct contact with that is not recommended. Also, um, if it's unfinished, it probably has a rough surface, so that could be uh, problematic as well. Uh, the sanding and painting will help. Um, you definitely don't want to display something on the wood for a long period of time because the um, acidic, uh, volatile acidic products from wood, they can pass through paint. Um, one solution might be to uh, wrap the wood with aluminum foil um, in areas that are under the costume because the uh, aluminum foil is a really good vapor barrier. Um, so one could do that um, and then, you know, slip some cotton stocking net over it or um, cover that with fabric that you sew on. There might be a, a way to, uh, you know, sort of improve those wooden forms, make them more safe. Um, was, what was the other part? Um, the follow-up question to this was a lot of people were asking, can I use mannequins from a department store that I get? And then how would they prep those? Do they sand them? What paints do they use to cover them? Okay, um, yes, and some of the mannequins in our collection are, in fact, from department stores, and even the ones you purchase, that's what they're intended for, is uh, visual merchandising in uh, clothing retailers. Um, if the mannequin is rough, you yes, just go ahead and sand it. Um, what we use to paint our mannequins is uh, waterborne lacquer paint. 
um, and that's got sort of a tougher surface than a latex paint. Um, you can use uh, latex paint as well. Um, spraying it on gives you a better finish. You know, brushing it on, you'll get brush marks. What's really important, critically important, is that you don't put any garments on there until the paint has had a chance to cure and uh, off-gas. And that would be a minimum of two weeks. Um, and you want to make sure that the paint is curing properly. We've, uh, before I came here, some mannequins came from a manufacturer. And uh, just the way they were wrapped in bubble pack transferred onto the paint. And then um, we've had an instance where some of our uh, under padding has actually stuck to the paint on a mannequin. So... Um, I'm not sure the best way to know uh, absolutely that you're not going to have problems with paint, but um, waiting a good period of time after something's painted before you put it in contact with the garment, and then isolating the actual garment from the paint is good. And some of those, uh, you know, understructures that we put on serve that function as well, in, the, in addition to being kind of non, non-skid or holding padding in place. So that's an argument for that. Well, great. Thank you so much. And I think there are a few questions we weren't able to get to, uh, but there will be resources posted. Uh, As soon as this recording is available, you'll be able to find the recording on the online community on the homepage uh, for a bit. And then you can also find it under that menu called Webinar Archives. Uh, So we'll have some more resources for you. And if you do have a question that's still burning and we haven't gotten to it right now or in the Q&A box, um, I encourage you to go on the community and post the question in the discussion forum. Uh, we'll keep an eye on that, and you'll also get some great feedback from other members on the community. Kathleen and Petra, thank you so much for leading this discussion today. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having us, and uh, clearly we could have gone on and on much longer. There's a <laughs> lot to cover, but it was fun to share a little bit. Great. And thank you to all our participants. Have a fantastic afternoon. Thank you.